Where in the world did we get our liturgies from? That's what we're going to talk about today. Liturgy is like a strong tree whose beauty is derived from the continuous renewal of its leaves, but whose strength comes from the old trunk with solid roots in the ground. Pope Paul VI. Today we're going to talk about liturgies. I was kind of interested just to find out where they came from, i.e., you know, entered the church later in college, and it was already part of my church. I go to a confessional Lutheran church. The liturgy is very strong. But also, I have gone to church with my Catholic friends, and it seemed similar in many ways. In fact, I didn't feel out of place. There were just a few different parts here and there, but it felt very similar. And I guess when you think about the history of it all, it makes some sense. Now, I'm not someone, or at least I thought, who liked liturgy. I like shaking things up. If you ask me what restaurant I want to go to, I want to go to a different restaurant every week. If you ask me where do I want to go camping, I want to go camping someplace new every year. I'm just kind of a person who likes to shake it up. And I find sometimes that the church calendar, the liturgy itself, oh gosh, I don't know, was boring me a bit. I hate to say it because our liturgy was written by Bach. And so, of course, it's beautiful. The music is beautiful. And now we have new hymnals and it is not quite what it used to be with Bach. So I kind of also miss the Bach part of it. And a lot of times what people try to do with liturgies is they felt bad for new Christians who didn't grow up with this. I didn't find that part hard at all. I was able to catch on quickly, actually more so when it was traditional Bach music. But as soon as it got new and sort of modernized, boy, I found the whole thing very confusing indeed. But I wondered, where do these come from? So I did a little bit of research trying to figure out what exactly it is that they came with. And of course, you know, back in the Old Testament, we talk about the tabernacle and the tent and carrying the tent through. I learned an interesting thing that a lot of times churches are in tent-shaped buildings because it's trying to express the tents that the tabernacle was in during the time of Exodus. But a lot of people would say that the liturgy is passed from apostle to apostle. You know, then it went down to the first early church, church fathers and what happened, I guess, is when you read a lot of it, is that each church kind of had its own flavor, its own taste of how it did services, although there were some things in common. But then it said that some heretical teachings got put into place. I wonder if, and this is just me making it up, you know, did Rome try to introduce Roman actions inside the church or Greek church or, you know, something like that? They didn't say exactly what that heresy was. But I mean, that's also why we got the Apostles' Creed, because someone was trying to say, no, this is the core of the church. So as people started bringing in things that were, oh, you know, not what people felt should be in there, that's when you started getting more and more rules around things. I mean, isn't that the case? You know, like you work for a company and people start screwing up and then suddenly there's all these rules. I mean, that's kind of the nature of human beings for sure. But a lot of the cases, you know, they tried to take aspects of Judaism and particularly Christianity. A big influence in how the church service was going was what Jesus did at the Last Supper, trying to take what he took was from Passover and turn it into a more dedicated service. I also used to think that there was some sort of a disagreement about when the Holy Day was, right? You know, oh, well, it used to be Friday night to Saturday, and that was Sabbath, and that's when services, but then it became Sunday. What happened? And of course, it's because Jesus was resurrected on Sundays, and so it's no longer Sabbath. It's now what we call the Lord's Day, Sunday. And so then as these traditions kind of came up through the churches, and we started out, right, the Church of Antioch, the Church in Alexandria, which is in Egypt, the Church in Rome the church in various places in what is now today Turkey, they started coming up with these traditions, trying to kind of piece it together to be a cohesive, tying to the ancient roots of the Christian faith, but also bringing in what Jesus brought in to it. And so the Greek word for, so liturgy is a word that comes from Greek, which means work of the people. And so it means, what, are, what is it we're going to do at our worship service? What not works works, but what are we going to do? What actions are we going to take? And so 
if your church has a liturgy, which my church does, then it's sort of a set standard form that of the service. Now, we're not as dedicated to it when I first became a Christian, but there are other churches that say that they're non-liturgical, but they still usually have some kind of pattern to it. And we do, in my church, have a pattern to it as well. And one of the first official church scriptures in the mid-300s, it said, was the Clementine Liturgy. And that was what uh, very similar to what we do in church today, at least the basis of it. So, for example, you know, what we try to do is we always try to praise God in the church. We always try to commit ourselves to God in church. We also try to confess our sins in church. Then we have communion and we have readings. And then at the very end, sort of uh, a goodbye, a go and have a, a week in Christ, you know, to send us off into the right way so that we're ready, spiritually charged to have our next week. Now, when I was Jewish, what we did is we had in our service, in our temple, which was way up at the top of the north, and it was a very a small community, we would have the reading of the Torah, which is going to be the first five books, the reading of the Hof Torah, which is going to be the prophets and the other books, and then usually a psalm or some singing of a psalm or responsive reading. And that kind of carried away. That is also very similar to what the church, the early church picked up. Again, these mostly were people who came out of Jerusalem were in the synagogue, got booted out of the synagogue, and so they were trying to bring aspects of their service together with them to this new entity that they were creating. And so the early church worship had reading of the scripture, which would be the Old Testament, then the gospels, and then a letter, singing of psalms and hymns, again, singing, and then prayer for the community, people in the community, for people around them in their towns, and the entire world. And then really it got formalized in Rome. Somewhere between the second and third century, Rome started to formalize practices of worship, figuring out like, what do we do for baptism? What do we do for the Lord's Supper? How do we send people as missionaries or new leaders of a church? That just started getting more and more formalized. There was something called the Edict of Milan that was in 313 AD where the Roman Empire got official status. So it was no longer a rogue religion where people were persecuted. And so that legalization meant that suddenly they could have buildings, they could have outfits, they could have rituals, they could even, you know, invest in architecture. And so that really is where the culture of Christianity started to grow. And then in 325 AD, of course, we know that in Nicaea there was the church council that started doing things like the Apostles' Creed, formalizing aspects, you know, the church structure. What is a leader? What is a deacon? What are the different roles between the church that formalized? So at that same time, suddenly we started seeing liturgies coming out because now, the, like I said, the culture of the Christianity started to grow. And so we had the Eastern Byzantine Church. We had the Roman Empire. These different groups And then we had the church in Alexandria again, I mentioned before. And so then these different groups started having the liturgy of St. John, the liturgy of St. Basil, and then suddenly a formal Roman rite, which became what the Roman mass is today. And it even says that in the Middle Ages, it even became more structured. And then we started seeing monasteries and different roles of writers, transcribers, different parts of it. Gregorian chants and rituals into the service. So it got more sophisticated during the Middle Ages. And then the last phase of it had to do with then the Reformation. So you saw people like Martin Luther and John Calvin, who had aspects of the Catholic liturgy they didn't like very much. And so they took some of it, they left some of it behind. I think John Calvin did not have music in the same way Catholic masses had, while Martin Luther liked music and was a musician and had children who were musicians. And so music and those aspects stayed mostly the same. So we, st- again, see in, in confessional Lutherans, like I said, a very strong tie to what the Catholic Mass is. And then it even changed again 
when post Vatican II, when the Pope decided to use common language instead of Latin, because what do people normally speak? How can people understand what is being said if the words are in Latin, which is the language they didn't know? And just to give you sort of a Lutheran side note, is I brought my mom to church one Sunday during Christmas time. And I thought, oh, you know, at least she could see what it is. So she doesn't think I'm in a cult or something weird. And unfortunately, this Christmas service was entirely in German. And I understood two words the entire time, Miriam and Joseph. I don't like, no oh, good gravy. You know, I got my mom to see, to try to see what this church service was. So she'd be more calm about, you know, what it is I joined and the whole thing was in German. So I understand that aspect of trying to make it a little bit more, oh, user friendly for everybody. And when I looked at the history of basically the Christian liturgy, it gave some areas of focus when talking about how we got it. Of course, originally Jerusalem because that was where John was now the head of the Jerusalem church after Jesus died. And they came up with their own methods of study that they had inside of Jerusalem, their own form of liturgy that people feel got really formalized somewhere in the mid-fourth century. But Rome, again, I mentioned before, was a big part of it as Rome started to coalesce their liturgies. And part of it comes in right at Justin Martyr, who defends baptism, the Eucharist, and somewhere around 150, they had something that was called Apostolic Tradition, which was a document for about two centuries, kind of telling how the various rites and the various services are kept. And one of the interesting things, I think, about Catholicism and Rome in general is that they have a lot of parts that were considered to be part of tradition. That tradition goes all the way back to Peter. Now, we might disagree about certain aspects, but there is a continuous chain of human beings that ran the church from Peter all the way up through current times. So I believe their libraries and their traditional pieces of data have at least a good reason to listen to it, to understand it, and to give it some leniency about whether it's original or not. The church in Alexandria had a huge area of the Christianity and was a big part of the original places. So two Christian theologians. One was Clement of Alexandria, and the other was Origen. You might have heard of both of them. Clement was from 150 AD until 215 AD. So if you think that John died in 90, then it was 60 years from the time that John lived until the time that Clement was around. If you think about Origen, he was 185 to 254-ish. And so they had their own liturgical practices that had meetings, symbolic meanings, the idea of the Trinity was there, and the Coptic church is very old. And if you go to Jerusalem and you look at the place where Jesus was on the cross in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's different churches that own different parts of it, and it's the Coptic church that owns the very center of it. So the, but the Egyptian church is very important, very old, and it has people doing early, early Christian writings. Having these liturgical texts right in Egypt was really important. You know, and they had things like morning prayer. They had music that was available to the worshipers. And getting sort of standardized in what they said, even a prayer book. You know, I think prayer books are interesting in general because to me, prayer is sort of this gut conversation between you and God. I call it in an unfriendly way, canned prayers are historic, are old. Even my church liturgy that I had when I first joined the church was very old. Like I said, all goes all the way back to probably the time of Bach or even maybe Luther himself. But some of these churches in Egypt said that they even had a liturgy that was of St. Mark's. That's how old it supposedly goes back. Syria was another part. We talked about the Phoenician woman in the Bible in Small Steps, how Jesus talked to her in the Phoenician area. This is Syria today. And so there are very ancient texts talking about other apostolic traditions from liturgy. And they had pieces of the Bible. They had different Eucharist and baptism celebrations than what we saw in Rome. And so it was a little bit different. But again, another very important part of the Christian tradition. 
And then Constantinople, that's when we started getting the Eastern Church versus the Western Church. Constantine, who was emperor of Rome in the fourth century, made gigantic building projects in there, including the Hagia Sophia, which today has been converted to a mosque. It was a church for all this time. It was one of the very first churches, again, that Constantine built. It became a mosque when originally Islam came through. It was returned by Turkey to becoming a church, and now it just got re mosked again. But it was Justinian, who was there at 527 to 65, who continued to draw up Christian traditions, had baptisms, had different kinds of song, liturgies, practical liturgies, prayers, patterns of worship. And so that got developed differently in Constantinople than Rome. And then, of course, the North African church. Carthage was a big part of that. Rome sacked Carthage. But then in around 250, wrote extensively on the leadership of the church. Now we're starting to get very formalized. And then there's going to be a canon. There's going to be certain prayers for penance. There's going to be celebration of different rites, including the Eucharist, including funerals. Those synods, those churches around North Africa were, again, very important voices in the beginnings of the church. Again, the liturgies, the celebrations. And so some of it comes from up there. And so then comes a lot of the rest of Europe. That was going to be a little bit later. But we had Ambrose, who was a bishop in Milan, 373, started coming up with his own ritual initiations, foot washings, different kinds of activities they did. Then even Spain started to catch on and come up with their own. This would be more towards 400 AD with their own feasts, seasonal liturgies. Gaul, which is going to be the Galatians, and they had a Bishop of Lyons who was not from Gaul originally, but brought in a lot of liturgical references, leanings. And by the time 500 AD came around, there, it was very well documented about their strong cultural practices. So it, it is something that has a, a big effect. And you can see, like I said, as Christianity spread out, the church became stronger and stronger, more and more structured, having documentations of what is a leader, what is a rite, what is a worship celebration, what is a prayer book, and also what are these liturgies. And I thought this was interesting. There was a book that was talking a little bit about liturgies, and I wish I could recommend the book, but the book was about something else entirely, so it's not that helpful. But it did mention some things that are common to almost all liturgies inside of the church. Some of them are Catholic, some of them are Protestant, but some of it is the procession. I think I've seen that more in Catholic churches where the priest and the vicars walk up with the candles at the beginning of the church service. An invocation, which usually has the sign of a cross, and that is where the priest or the pastor invokes the name of Jesus at the beginning of the service. Confession, we do that at my church. We have confession, and that might be individual confession, and that might be like my pastor. We have a, a group confession that is published on our video screens that we can read along. And sometimes there are old confessions that are standard, and sometimes there are some new ones. And I like some of the new ones because it talks about the things we don't do and the things we miss doing and we don't know we're doing. And I thought some of it's good. Then comes absolution. That comes from the priest or the pastor. Psalms or singing of hymns. We are a big hymnal group. Then we might have our individual or pastor-led prayers that are about other types of issues. Then we might have readings. We used to do more um, responsive reading when I first joined the church. We don't do that anymore. But we used to do that also in the synagogue. But some sort of usually psalms where we would read back and forth to each other. But in my church now, we just have someone, either a vicar, pastor, or a layperson, come up and read something from the Gospels, something that is going to be our sermon text for that day, maybe a psalm, and maybe something from the Old Testament. Then we usually say the creed which is going to usually be the Apostles' Creed. There's the Athanasian Creed, which if you haven't ever seen that, you should look it up because it's kind of interesting. But, you know, basically a common statement of faith that we can all get on board with. This is the core, in our opinion, of Christianity. Then the Lord's Prayer. We have an offering while there's some music. Then communion. 
some churches did communion, obviously, I think in the early church, much more often. We do it every other week. Then at the end, the pastor offers us peace, hope that, you know, peace follows us the rest of the week, and then a benediction. We sing following him. But this is a common structure, I think, among many churches. And your church might have something a little bit different, but that's how our church goes. And like I said, it's very similar in most churches. We also have something that we call Vespers at My Church, which is a Wednesday night service. It tends to be a little bit more informal than the Sunday church services. But that's kind of the short history of liturgies and why we have them today and how they came down to us. So my challenge to you is think about your liturgy. Is it a structured liturgy? Is it a non-liturgical church where you go through various patterns that are not very set in stone? You know, think about it and think about what their pattern of worship means to you or means to the church. What was the intention of this particular liturgical pattern? If you don't know, you might be able to look up a little bit of history about your own church and figure out where they got this particular service from. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. And if you have anything to say or a topic you'd like me to cover, just let me know. And just remember, our historical walk through the liturgy has roots all the way back to the apostles. Mm -hmm.